Um, thanks, guys, for being here. Um, and thanks for having me and being able to present. Um, the topic I have uh, brought with me is improving search uh, via query experimentation. And what this means is that we want to try to improve our system over time uh, on a data level. Um, so. um, yeah, uh, just a, a couple of sentences about me. I am a founder and CTO of SearchUp.io, and I'm doing really, um, I, I love improving uh, product discovery. So this mainly is about search and recommendations in the terms of uh, e-commerce, and I do this now since uh, 20 years. And the last three to four years I spent on that topic, and I want to yeah, um, share a little bit uh, about um, what I did there or what we did there. Um, only, I promise only one slide about the company so that you know what we are doing. So essentially, SearchUp is an autopilot for search. So it, um, every search I know out there um, has some kind of configuration. And um, our tool, um, let's say, adapts and, and changes configurations on the fly, intercepts the data, so the incoming data from your users, and, and tries to, to find the optimal balance between all of that. And it works with any uh, search engine. So we have uh, customers that run on Algolia, that run on their own um, search, some on, even on SQL, and we don't care about that. And we do this on a reasonably large scale, I would say. Um, yeah, so if you are interested, visit our site. Um, one important thing, um, I'm not going to talk about uh, generative AI vector search or LLMs. Sorry for that. But uh, I, I promise uh, that I will talk about some other interesting things. So instead, I will try to frame the problem. So what does it mean to improve search over time? Because um, it's not very well known. Then I will um, explain a little bit about search experimentation and testing. Uh, the metrics um, that are most likely, you should most likely choose. Um, I will sketch out um, a potential solution, so how we did it, uh, the obstacles along the way, and um, I will recap on is it really worth it, because it was a lot of work. So first of all, I would like to start with what does it mean to improve search at scale. Um, if you look at the paper or a lot of blog posts or if you talk to vendors, um, they will something like that. Yeah, you just have to plug in technology or approach X and then you will see an improvement of Y. And the most important word in this sentence is N. You can't forget about everything else because the thing is, it's pretty easy to improve a system for a given um, snapshot, uh, snapshot. So this means I'm not changing anything uh, around it. I'm just, um, let's say, um, checking out what is the problem, I can fix it, and that's it. However, in reality, you are facing a different problem because you are dif uh, facing different versions of your search system over time. So the index documents change over time, the queries you see, um, or the incoming queries, um, your system will, will see uh, change over time, configurations change, o change over time, and even features change over time. So. It's not enough to say, yeah, we, we wanted to try something out, we have a great idea, now we test it, or we get a positive result, and now um, to think that this will stay like that incrementally, this can be totally wrong, to be honest. And I will share you some um, real um, cases later. So the fundamental question is, do changes um, improve or decrease search quality over time? And this is um, what um, yeah, we will focus on. So, um, yeah, I have the next three slides are all real case um, examples. However, I, um, yeah, I decided to, um, to use a kind of stylized view on it because I don't want to blame anyone. Um, but here, this is a really typical example um, uh, we see at our customers. So at late, um, earlier in time, somebody had a problem um, with, for example, now here, recall um, when you search for laptops and maybe all your products and your uh, documents um, are called uh, notebooks, um, you couldn't find them. So somebody had a great idea, hey, why not create a synonym? So laptop and, and notebook are now equally, and now you can, you can see oh, I have a perfect um, example. So all the retrieved products are, or let's say in the top at least, uh, are from the product type laptop. But then um, somebody else uh, said, yeah, we need to have a, a larger assortment. Maybe we should transform into a marketplace. So let's onboard tons of new products. Um, and what happened then is, um, um, yeah, it gets saturated because sketchbooks, 
Um, these are the, 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 the small books you can write in, are also called notebooks in a lot of cases. And you, we end up um, with such a result like this. I'm not judging if this is better or not. It's just, I would say, for the person at T0 that, um, let's say, introduced the, the, um, the synonym, I don't think it was clear before that this could happen. Another thing we, we see uh, more and more are redirects. So a lot of companies are really um, using, let's say, merchandising power to uh, um, create their own pages for certain kind of products. And for sneakers, sneakers is, by the way, a very interesting um, um, problem because it's a kind of known concept, yeah, but it's very hard to formalize. A lot of, a lot of um, um, sneakers are never called sneakers, so only, let's say, between us, but um, a vendor would never call them sneakers, so it's, it's pretty hard to find it in the data if you have all your sneakers together or if it's just sport shoes or shoes or kind of um, shoes for a specific um, um, kind of use case. Um, so that's why the, at, at T0 somebody said, yeah, our retrieval is bad, so let's redirect everything to uh, uh, the category shoes. Uh, but later, because the, the IT guys or ML guys or whatever, whoever improved retrieval, now it really finds better results. But still, the whole traffic is going to be redirected to, um, to the shoes category. Maybe again, not the, what uh, was intended to happen. Um, and in the last couple of, let's say, I would say 12 months, what we see more and more, because we are in, in front of the search, um, more and more uh, customers want to uh, test out vector search. And since we can directly, um, um, let's say, route the traffic, we can test it also. And vector search is great, but it, it doesn't work for each and every query. And um, for some, you can see, the, the initial retrieval would have even be better than uh, um, um, for the vector ones. So again, on, on, if you, let's say, consider the search overall, it might be better, but at least for certain uh, um, queries, um, you could improve. Um, yeah, and one of my yeah, greatest, um, um, let's say, statements I've ever read is this one. So if you cannot learn from the past, you are doomed to re repeat it. And that's what, uh, in a lot of cases, happens when people try to improve search. Um, that's why, that this is my definition of search ex experimentation. I haven't found another one. But at least uh, for us, it's measuring the impact of changes to the retrieval system over time. Yeah. Again, what the market tells you, yeah, we have some great product. You can just uh, plug in this experimentation or multivariate testing platform X, and then you'll be able to incrementally improve your search. The, but let's think about this for a minute. So I don't know if you are aware of how testing and experimentation works. But essentially, what you're doing is you're taking your population and then you're randomizing upon it. So you say, if I have a, a perfect random function and I split, for, for example, uh, my users into two different buckets, they should overall um, um, kind of behave the same. And if not, so if I, if I can measure a difference, then the difference should be significant. So I have changed something or something fundamentally has changed. Um, most um, um, systems do this on users or sessions. And this is also what most people I'm aware of working in search do their A-B tests on. So they are um, um, randomizing on users or sessions. So it depends what, what data you have. Um, but how can you then judge query-based changes? Yeah. So think about this for a second, because I will go into that. Um, the next thing is, to be able to do a proper experimentation, um, we need some kind of fundamental baseline knowledge about the under, um, underlying distribution. And the under, underlying distribution should be normally distributed. And users and sessions are, if you're using a proper randomization function. Uh, so if you can really say, um, yeah, I, I want to have a 50-50 split, and it really splits it 50-50, and not like 40-60 or something like that. Um, but for queries, you cannot. So it looks different. It's more a kind of uh, Cyprian um, distribution. Um, so this is al already the first thing. So you can transform this um, distribution into a normal distribution, 
but you will lose uh, information. But the, the real problem is this one. So if we perfectly split our users or the sessions in two groups, how many queries can we really experiment on in, on, on in parallel? And the important thing is here, um, this, sorry for this um, 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 small graph, but essentially on the, uh, the x-ax, it says the common queries um, across sessions. So what are the common queries between the users in the sessions? And then the likelihood, yeah? how often this appears. And if we are randomizing on users, we at least lose 60% um, of the initial opportunity. So this is from, from real data for across our customers. And since such da data is anyway pretty sparse, I don't want to lose 60% of it, to be honest. Yeah. Um, another really important um, um, question you have to answer yourself, um, can we guarantee variant equality? Are you aware of SRM? So SRM is kind of the sample ratio mismatch. So if you're not really splitting 50-50, you're introducing an, a kind of um, an error in your whole e experiment, which can fundamentally change the outcome of the experiment. So that's why you, you should really um, um, check if you have an S SRM or not. So it's, it's the, um, the equality of the variance sizes. And for users and sessions, yes, as said earlier, and you can really use them, um, but only for global impacting changes. So if you're introducing, let's say, learning to rank across the board, um, let's say um, um, you change field weights across the board. So if, if you're doing really global changes on your search, it works perfectly well with users and sessions, but for query dependent changes, it does not. And maybe there are different ways to do it, but one, at least for, for me, obvious way is to try to do it query-based, to not split on user or session, but split on query. So we are essentially using the same randomization method, but we are using a different um, unit. And when you have this in your pocket, you can then say, OK, depending on the change, so this is the change you made to the system, we can choose the right randomization unit. Yeah? So if I did something global, I can go with uh, the normal um, um, session or user test, but if I change something specific, query specific, then I can go on, uh, on a query level. Um, another important thing is which metrics could we uh, um, use for improving search over time? And this is one of the really, really important um, um, slides. So there is a huge difference in what managers typically want. And managers typically want, show me the money. So um, it's kind of more like North Star metrics, like um, conversion rate or average revenue per user. However, in reality, when you really test it, um, there are a lot of problems with these North Star metrics. Um, this is a really great paper. It's called a Pareto, Pareto Optimal Proxy Metrics. Have a look at it. But what it essentially says is that if you're looking at these um, last um, or late stage KPIs, it's really, really hard um, to, to, f to, if you change in f uh, at the beginning something, to, to bring everything um, 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 back to the end, because a lot of stuff can, can happen around it. For example, um, imagine you really improved your search, and then in the checkout, uh, in, in, in the checkout area, somebody screwed up, changed the payment um, uh, modalities on something like that, um, yeah, then you are essentially screwed. Um, that's why, um, yeah, be, be aware with Novstar metrics. Um, what we found out is that there are at least some least fragile ones, and these are um, um, KPIs that are, you can think of it as positive direct proxy metrics. So when you search and you directly click, when you search, you directly click and, for example, add it to the basket, so you have a, the attention window is, is very, very small, you get more accurate results. So we do this um, on a probabilistic way, and we call it search paths. Others call it micro sessions. So we are essentially um, dividing sessions into smaller ones, with have, which have more context. But this really helps um, to, to figure out if your search gets better, at least on these KPIs or not, because it 
removes the errors that come um, from later stages. And um, for us, for example, um, the KPIs for the uh, search path um, with the biggest scope are the CTR, so the click-through rate, then the add-to-basket rate, and the average added basket revenue per uh, query as well. So we have some kind of feedback when it comes to money, um, but yeah, it might not be the one um, you are essentially then buy and later. Um, it, at least from, from what we saw in, in, in production is that it's often better to have a clean um, direct proxy metric than a fuzzy North Star metric, yeah, because you never know um, what happened um, between. Yeah, then I would like to sketch out a potential solution. So how could a system like this um, look like? So first of all, um, if you go on a, I mean, typically it's like that. You say, f um, for example, um, um, we have a new ML model for ranking. Um, we think it should improve our system, let's say, X percent. Um, so we want to try um, and, and test it. So then you go into a, a design phase and really test it. However, here in our case, when we are, let's say, working with potentially millions or billions of queries, uh, identifying uh, experiments is pretty important because nobody will create millions of exper experiments in our system, so we have to artificially come up with them. So here, um, it's, it's more, um, uh, mostly about what can we observe changes in the system or in the user behavior, and by that um, find uh, potential candidates for an ex experiment. Uh, in the second part, this is experiment design. So there we will, for example, based on the data we have, on the object um, we want to we wanna experiment with, um, as, as said earlier on the randomization unit, we have to design the experiment, so it's kind of initializing it. And then we have the platform, so where all the data and experiments are managed. Um, sorry, so the next three slides have a little bit um, more of text but I at least try to highlight um, the important one, ones uh, or the Im important phrases, sub-phrases, um, but it's really, yeah, you have to have the context of it, otherwise I don't know if, if, yeah, if the message gets through. Um, so as I said earlier, um, since we're doing this with millions of queries uh, and thousands of alternat alterations or alternatives, you, need, um, or you should have at least a semi-automatic system for identifying experiments. Um, then this identification needs to be supported by observations. So, for example, if I see that um, for certain queries the behavior changed dramatically and I see that for other um, queries it did not, I could uh, come up with a classification model that says, hey, we think this is query specific, and then um, um, we create um, an experiment um, and yeah, kind of start it and see um, what comes out of it. Um, as I said earlier, you can use these um, observations also to, distinct, to distinguish between the global shifts and the query-specific variations. And one thing we learned the hard way is that for efficiency reasons, so if you are creating these experiments automatically, you also automatically create a lot of bullshit, to be honest. So there will be a lot of experiments that might look um, brilliant, but you don't have enough traffic to prove them. Or um, it's, a, it's a, let's say, you, you think, ah, now um, Christmas trees are, are going uh, pretty well, but two, two weeks after, nobody searches for it um, anymore, so you, you will never get a, um, a result, or let's say, um, yeah, and a result that adds any value. So you can directly filter out a lot of these um, created experiments. Then um, experiment design. Um, so based on what the classification model tells you, is it query specific or is it um, a global change, um, you then, um, let's say, initialize the experiment, you pick the right uh, type of randomization unit, um, and then you use, and you hopefully have that, um, the prior data to yeah, initialize the experiment. And so there you need to um, be aware of, let's say, the MDE, so the mean, um, um, <coughs> Uh, the mean detectable effect, uh, the minimum detectable effect, then which creates then your minimal sample size uh, and all these kind of things. So this is a kind of the base setting of your experiment. 
Um, yeah, and we we ran ran um, with the following um, free or the, the main free uh, KPIs. You can use more, but at least this minimal sparseness and um, this um, re reduction of external influences is really really important, uh, because otherwise. You, what you essentially will see is that your baseline variant will always win because you cannot really observe um, a significant difference. And then the platform, um, as I said earlier, so here you, we um, essentially store, start, evaluate, uh, and end and re-evaluate experiments. So you have to have a system for that, uh, so essentially a, a database. Um, but what um, I really would like to uh, point out is that because again, we learned it the hard way. For the different evaluations and for different KPIs, you might need different statistical methods or evaluation methods. Um, so have that in mind. Build it as a kind of, yeah, um, plug and play thing, so you can you can um, move around things. Oh, now imagine we have all the building blocks together, and we um, throw product data on it. Um, yeah, we are fine, and everything works great. Yeah, well, um, there were a few obstacles on the way, um, which I will uh, talk to you about now. So, search data is sparse, and there is nothing you can do about it. So even, let's say, these really proxy metrics that are really, really close to the initial, ser initial search request, um, you only have uh, um, um, little of them. There are some queries, with a lot of traffic where, where this is not an issue, but we have millions of queries which um, have been searched, for example, two, three, four times uh, over a whole year and with one click. So what can you do here? Nothing, essentially. Well, there are, there are at least some kind of methods that can reduce this problem. So first, the first one is we can aggregate by, aggregate by search intent. And the second one, this is um, 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 more from the statistics side of things. There are statistical uh, methods that still provide valid experiments um, with uh, less or um, little data. Um, so one thing that re greatly um, um, improves on sparseness is um, aggregation by search intent. So what does it mean? Um, essentially, let's say if, if you are seeing uh, 10 millions of different queries, um, then it's not like you have 10 millions of different um, intents. It's more like you have different, a lot of different variations for the same intent. Like I'm, I'm searching for a shirt or shirts, essentially it's the same intent. Yeah, but in a lot of, in a lot of systems, it's just treated as two different queries with two different um, KPIs. And by aggregating them together and uh, the, the KPIs originating um, from them, you can greatly reduce uh, the sparseness. Um, so what you see here in the graph is essentially nothing else than um, um, yeah, a kind of the long tail curve, but uh, we, 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 we present it like this because um, there you see the direct impact. So on the, on the x-axis you have the share of total unique queries and on the y-axis um, you have the share of, total, uh, of the total frequency and by aggregating together you give kind of or you move traffic from the, the long tail more to the mid and to the, to the short tail. And this helps because sparseness is really a huge issue. Uh, another important thing, and I think tomorrow will be an interesting talk about that as well, not from me, but from others, is there are, there are uh, um, statistical methods out there that can greatly help um, with, let's say, reducing the time you need for an experiment to run. And one uh, that I would like to um, point out here and which worked really great for us is group sequential testing. So group se sequential testing is kind of, um, you can think of, you have normally you have your test and you have to have your minimal sample size and um, only when you reach the minimal sample size you come up with a judgment. But group sequential test says, okay, I'm splitting this into separate um, evaluations and for every time I, I, I evaluate, I get an, a result. And based on how late I am in the overall process, um, it gets more likely that it's a real um, valid result. And we are mainly using it not for saying, yeah, this was a success, 
but we are using it for stopping or aborting um, experiments when there is no chance that they will ever get um, a positive um, effect. So for us, about 60% um, of all the experiments um, cross some of these, um, let's say, yeah, thresholds, and then they get skipped, and the, the normal baseline um, wins. Uh, un un unfortunately, um, when you handle or you have experiments with little or, or let's say, small sample sizes, um, and unfortunately, a lot of people are not aware of it, it gets really, really complicated uh, to control uh, the statistical type 2 error, wi um, which comes normally from statistical power. So if you have um, only, let's say, 400 or 500 or 200 observations, um, you could even measure a, st a statistically significant outcome, but it's most probably just useless. Yeah, it could be uh, uh, random. Um, and therefore, one, one really awesome thing is to not use um, the post-experiment power. Uh, instead, come up with a model that uses, for example, all your tests you had before, and then adjust your p-value um, accordingly, um, depending on uh, how much uh, sample size you've already seen. And this works really great as well. Another <laughs> problem is that search data is unstable. Well, um, so it's very, very sensitive to trends, seasonality, uh, and when data gets unstable, and you see this in the fluctuating KPIs, what it essentially does is it, it introduces a lot of variance, and variance is not what we want to have when we experiment with data, because it increases the, the data we need, or the sample size we need to at least have. But again, there are also um, solutions um, out there. Um, one thing is definitely to cap an experiment. So for example, for us, um, um, if an experiment doesn't show a significant difference um, after 28 days, um, we just stick with the baseline. Yeah, because other, um, um, we, uh, uh, the longer you, you, uh, you uh, um, uh, run the experiment, the more likely it will be influenced uh, from trends or, or something like that. The, interest, the, the good thing is, however, theoretically, after 28 days, you can run the experiment again. So you can still capture these kind of things. And um, one um, additional method, so it's again a statistical method you can use to reduce um, um, this high variance, is called, I don't know how it's spelled, cubed, uh, I guess so. Um, but what it essentially does is it uses prior data, um, and then the data you observe, and by blending it together, you're, re you're reducing the, um, the variance out of it, and it really greatly um, reduces the, the number of minimum samples you need. Um, I'm, I have to say, this is a, a, a really good um, example. There are examples where you cannot match these numbers. Yeah. So it depends on your data. Um, for us, the most challenging um, part was, to be honest, um, is that search data is imbalanced. So imagine you want to run an A-B test um, for what we had earlier, for let's say the two queries, laptop and notebook, and check if the combination of both or either one of them um, creates a better uh, result in terms of the proxy metrics. Then you, your searches might look like this, and as, as you see, this is not an equal, um, so it's, they are not equally distributed. Um, essentially, notebook um, um, rules um, most of the, of the traffic. But the good thing is that at least in, in, in search, um, you normally, we are talking about a process. So it's not like a fire and forget. Um, people tend to use, for example, auto suggestions. Then they land, uh, they pick one. Then they land on a search result page. They may be presented some query recommendations, and by that you can really influence what queries um, are going to get issued afterwards or even in the first place. And by that you can really actively balance, um, um, yeah, your your unique searches across, let's say, the, the queries that are in um, an experiment currently. To give you an example, as I said earlier, um, so here 
um, notebook rules, and now, for example, in query suggestions, you can come up with AI. I'm, I'm really going to put um, uh, the laptops on top uh, until I reach a kind of more equally distribution, and when I do so, um, it greatly reduces my, my um, experiment runtime and um, most probably generates better, um, a better result. So it's just two, two different ways. So query recommendations and query suggestions, maybe there are more. Um, I really think that this is a, um, the, the UI and UX part should come in here as well. There may be tons of more interesting um, ways on how you could do that. Yes, then, um, as said earlier, the, the filtering thing is important. And it is even uh, also important once you, you could not filter out an experiment and it starts. Even if your prior data says, A, it should be great, you should have enough uh, traffic um, to, to, to finish an experiment, things can dramatically change. Here, um, a, a query that was um, not a, re a no-result query um, now turns to a zero-result query. Not a lot to learn, to be honest, there. Um, marketing campaigns are phasing in or phasing out, Se seasons phasing in, phasing out. So you should implement fast exits. Um, maybe not from, from a statistical point of view. So I always um, say to my customers, um, leave, leave them running. But the customers say, yeah, but if it's a zero result or if the campaign is not anymore, please shut it off. Uh, there's nothing to test. Well, it, I mean, it's their decision. And another, I would say, interesting um, aspect is, is significance really all we care about. So uh, in, the, in the typical um, frequentist way, um, you have a binary outcome, essentially. So the test was significant or it was not significant. But in, for business people, they, are, they, are, they, don't, can, can, they can't really cope with, let's say, binary decisions. What they want to have is they want to manage risk. So they want to say, yeah, probably it's 10% better. So what is, what, is the, um, what is the worst case scenario? How does it look like? Could I get the 10% and maybe not throw um, something of my uh, bottom line away? So we need to find ways to combine both. And that's why, for example, we really combined uh, the frequentism and Bayesian approach, because the Bayesian approach gives you um, yeah, an insight of, of uh, how likely things will be. Yeah, so um, if the risk of being better is quite high, uh, if, the, if the chances of being better is quite high, and the risk of being much worse is, is minimal, so why not try? Yeah, you can stop it any, uh, anyway, um, but you can at least try. Yeah, then I want to talk about, is it really worth it, um, this um, incremental system? And here are some facts from, from Prod. So uh, I just pulled the, the, the numbers. So last week, we finished uh, about uh, 1,900 experiments for our customers. Um, at the average success rate is about 8.5%. Uh, so this means that in 8.5%, the, uh, the variant actually beat the baseline, uh, or have beaten the baseline. And the uh, average uh, treatment effect is 16.1%. And then you say, Whoa, why should I care? The thing is, you will be able to leverage the power of tiny gains. So if I can improve my search every day 1%, the, the overall uh, improvement is extremely high after um, uh, one year. Uh, the same applies uh, if I configure, uh, misconfigure my system and it gets worse uh, 1% every day, it's also quite uh, um, yeah, a dramatic effect. And what we saw is that um, we mainly focus on sellability and findability. So these are internal metrics for our customers. Um, but we, were, we uh, managed to improve them on a weekly base about um, half a percent, which doesn't seem a lot. But if you aggregate it now over the last five months, we are running this completely on, then it's already uh, almost 10% over the entire uh, period. And the interesting thing is that there is no sign of decline, no sign of any seasonal effect that, that uh, does change that. Because we always have a holdout variant. So we, when you t we test something, we leave some traffic aside. Um, um, like, we would never change it. Yeah. We, but we still have some areas to work on, 
And um, to be honest, I don't think this is really technical. That's why we maybe not yeah, the best um, uh, to work on that. But communicating experiment results is a hard thing. Um, so for us, for example, um, um, our customers mainly uh, um, um, care about um, CTR and um, the average, um, so the add-to-basket ratio. What happens if CTR goes through the roof and um, the, the basket ratio doesn't move? What should a customer do? So how do I communicate that? I mean, the customer, of course, I could, I could just show him the numbers, but this is not, not what helps him. So he wants to have at least a guideline what to do. The next one is, in a lot of cases, so I mentioned earlier, we have a success rate of roughly 8%. So all the other um, 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 experiments kind of fail. But in a lot of cases, they are just pretty close um, um, or we stopped them when they were at al almost significant, um, but they are not, so we have to stop them. Um, uh, so, and how could we, could we tell the customer, yeah, maybe it's not significant yet, but the potential is very high. So you could try what is the, the, the worst case scenario if it, if it fails um, um, and, and these kind of things. So it's really, we really have to, to, to work on that because right now people just, if, if they see it, like, like for example here, say, oh, yeah, well, control wins. I'm, I'm not going to touch the system anymore. Maybe um, we can come up with, 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 with different views on the data or, or different ways of articulating it maybe um, to encourage the user to say, yeah, let's give it a try. Let's do something um, and, 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 and observe it differently. Yeah, and now? Um, um, after all I, I told you, go out and hopefully make uh, the search experimentation work on your organiz organization as well. Thank you. Thanks, Andreas. Are there any questions? Stand up. Perfect. Oops, sorry. Um, so this is mainly assuming something like an e-commerce setup where you have a lot of users coming for the first time, right? Or like not having a habit of using the domain, the the search itself. Um, what I've noticed in in some other domains, or in my domain in music, where we have users that have been using the search for a long time, is that when you change something, even for the noticeably better, or you think it's better, there's like a shock effect. Like at first, metrics go all down for a while, and then they improve and get better than they were initially. Um, have you had something like that? Like, have you noticed these kind of effects, yes. and how do you take them into consideration? Um, I, didn't, I didn't mention it because it's a, it's a kind of really complex scenario, but we have that all of our, um, across our customers as well. I give you one striking example. It's something completely different if I buy, for example, a shirt for three euro or a fridge for 2,000 euros. So the, the, the buying process will look completely different. So a shirt, normally it's like you search for it, you click it, you buy it, and that's it. For a fridge, may, you maybe have five or six different sessions where you first look at it, then you go somewhere else to you familiarize, and, and then you finally decide to buy or not. And the cool thing is that as a, as a, we, we randomize on the query, but a user will still get the same result um, that, he did, uh, that he had before for, um, for the same query. The, the interesting thing is that we can now use more of our traffic to say, you searched for, you searched for um, let's say, shirt. You're not A or, you are A or B. Um, but when you are now issuing another query, you can be C or D. That's the thing. I know it's a little bit hard, but it's, it's not about changing um, results to a, a single user. It's more, more taking the whole information of the session to be able to test 
a lot, the, all the queries that are inside the session at the same time. I would put it like that. Okay, thank but, you. But I agree. And, and by the way, that's another great way to explain this Northstar metrics. So I really encourage you to take KPIs that are close to, to, to the initial action. So when you search, all the, the let's, let's put bot traffic aside, um, all the um, incoming signals that are close to this initial event are more valuable than um, the late stage ones. I, I just want great talk. You always have great talks. Um, Thank you. I, we had an A-B test recently, P equals 0 0.07 that we didn't ship. I was a little sad about that. But actually, we did ship it after another A-B test. But I wanted to ask if you had looked at interleaving as another way to get query level sensitivity, because that's something we find give, lets us debug our queries much better than our, like, KP, our KPIs and stuff. I would, yes, I would love um, to do more of that. The problem is 99% um, of our customer environments are not able to do that. That's, and we have to work with what we have. I mean, in an, in an optimal uh, scenario, I would do these kind of things because then you could really use 100% of the traffic. Um, but um, I, as I said, maybe from the top of my, maybe one customer <laughs> is able to do that. Okay, so we are done with the questions and time a little bit. Um, take opportunity to reach out to Andreas uh, in the coffee break. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you.